Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation and the Cleon Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, with razor-thin margins, Utah and the nation continue to watch election results. What is happening in Utah's 4th District? Which propositions could fail? And how has historic voter turnout impacted results? With Democrats seizing majority in the House, how will Utah's delegation be impacted? What does this mean for our state's influence in national politics? Will it affect the public lands debate? And locally, what can we expect from new leadership in our state legislature? Good evening and welcome to The Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Robert Gerke, columnist for the Salt Lake Tribune, Nicole Nixon, political reporter for KUER, and Glenn Beebe, political reporter for ABC4 News. So glad to have you all with us today. Uh, politics this week has just been so interesting and we have the election that doesn't end. We're gonna start with you, Robert, okay? Uh, let's talk about the fourth congressional district for a moment. Uh, we, we have some numbers out. It looks like Ben McAdams is ahead by 1,002 votes. Give or take one or two. Uh, give or take, with, with more information coming in daily. So that's just a snapshot in time. So I guess I'm gonna start with this. Uh, are you ready to call this race? <laughs> well, when we started counting votes, I think I was clean shaven. It's, got, it's <laughs> kind of gone downhill since then. <laughs> no, I don't think we're gonna know the winner of this race for, I mean, the canvas is Tuesday, so you know, stay tuned for that. Um, we've, got a, we've got votes, uh, provisional ballots out, outstanding in Utah County. We've got provisional ballots outstanding in Salt Lake County, about 35,000 total in those two counties. So with those with those narrow margins of Ben's narrow lead right now, we expect that to flip when Utah County comes in and Mia to be a little bit ahead. It, but it's it's anybody's race. And, and, and part of the issue is we don't really know, because we don't have experience with the same day registration that we did this year, how those provisional votes are going to break down. And I, I, I don't think any of us have a sense. We yeah. really don't. Yeah. And that's the thing. Was it younger kids who were waiting till the last minute to get in? Was it people that didn't get their mail-in ballots, so they went and filled out a provisional? It's too hard to tell at this point, but it does go to show how important that same day registration was when you have more than 30,000 mm -hmm. uh, between the two most populous counties. It shows that it really did make a difference. Yeah. There's a there's a school of thought, I guess, that a lot of these people, uh, especially in Salt Lake County, are young people who wanted to vote for Prop 2. And so the thinking being that that would favor McAdams a little bit when those break down because they're going to be more progressive. But I'm not sure how that works with Utah County because the church coming out hard against Prop 2, those people in Utah County might be more opposed to Prop 2 and, and, and encouraged to vote in that sense. So it could have a, a counter effect, I guess, in, in that regard. Huh. We don't know. <laughs> we don't. We're watching very closely, though. But that doesn't stop the intrigue or lawsuits. Nicole, let's talk about that for just a moment, too, because uh, Mia Love uh, and her campaign have filed a lawsuit just this week. Maybe describe what that lawsuit is and what they're hoping will happen. Yeah, so uh, the Love campaign filed this lawsuit against the Salt Lake County clerk. Um, they're alleging that their her campaign poll watchers didn't get the opportunity to analyze and, and maybe challenge uh, those signatures on mail-in ballots or provisional ballots that they think might not match up with what's in the data. Database. Um, they have all campaigns have poll watchers at the polls on election day, um, just in case they mm -hmm. see anything nefarious going on. But but with all these votes coming in in the mail and we're still counting them, they're they're saying that they want the opportunity to take that a little bit further the next couple weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, and it looks tough because they didn't file one in Utah County, and that was uh, something that the judge asked. Why is it that you didn't file it in Utah County, where there's still tens of thousands of ballots to count? And, and so, what was the answer? Uh, I. I forget what it was, the but time I, is of the time yes. is of the yes. time. The judge also asked why they didn't file this earlier. Um, this, this, they used the same process that uh, they did in 2016, the last time Mia Love ran for re-election, and and now that this race is so close, and and McAdams is um, up only in Salt Lake County, um, it it. 
the McAdams campaign alleges, and, and the judge seemed to question whether this was a politically motivated lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things, too, though, that sometimes if you're going to challenge something down the line after the canvas, let's say, you, you have to prove that you tried to challenge it before. So even though it may look political, like a desperate Hail Mary, you also have to kind of set a precedent that you brought it up during the canvas so that if down the line you have to sue, you could also say, well, we did bring it up before. I mean, I think the lawsuit isn't going to do much in the end because because frankly most of these ballots have been separated from the envelopes and the sig there's no way to reconnect the ballot to the signature at this point uh, they filed it after counting it was done in or after processing was done at least in Utah County so there was there's no way they can go back there uh, and and since they filed the lawsuit Salt Lake County's still moving through these ballots and there's really not that many mail-in ballots left to be counted so I think the lawsuit is kind of moot and I think mm -hmm. that's ultimately where it's going to come down but it's probably also not going to be the last lawsuit we have especially if this race comes down to a couple hundred votes. You're going to have provisional ballots being challenged as they go through those. You're going to have adjudication of spoiled ballots or, you know, marked ballots. Okay. And, and so there's, we're going to, we have the potential to have sort of a Florida scenario in the fourth district. And I think this first lawsuit is not going to be the last. Uh -huh. So Nicole, based on the explanation you gave of what's happening in this lawsuit, uh, help us understand what people are thinking about whose responsibility it is to watch that. Is it the right of the candidates or people thinking to be the ones that are verifying or do you just leave it with the clerks? Well, that's the question is um, people are asking, do you want political candidates involved in touching ballots after mm -hmm. they've already come into the county? And I think that that's what Salt Lake County argued is that this is the county's job and the county is doing a fine job of doing it. And even Governor Gary Herbert said yesterday that he thinks every vote in the 4th Congressional District will be fair and will be counted. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a process for candidates to have their poll watchers watching and observing, especially when they're doing the adjudication of, of contested ballots and mm -hmm. things like that. And they can object to those and they can challenge individual ballots. There's a provision in the law that allows them to challenge ballots, but there's not a provision in the law that allows them to challenge signatures. Mm -hmm. And so I think they're kind of trying to get the judge to write law, basically, and yeah. and, and and I think it's going to fail. But I, again, it's it's the first of many to come. I and think. if you see the process, if you've ever been behind the scenes, yeah. it's literally someone sitting in a computer looking at two signatures and giving their opinion of whether or not they think mm -hmm. they're close or close enough. They're not experts in any way, but who's to say that the campaigns would bring in people who are experts? Uh, you know, they if they have a question about it, that person will send it to a supervisor, and then maybe you can talk about that. But to sit there and try to challenge it, it almost seems like you're trying to slow down down the process, and we saw that in Florida in 2000. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't even think they're just trying to slow down the process. I think they're trying to get as many votes excluded in mm -hmm. Salt Lake County, knowing that if they that every vote they get thrown out, or every 10 mm -hmm. votes they get thrown out, is probably five or six for Ben McAdams. Yeah. And so, I mean, they're trying to they're trying to game the system a little bit. I, I was struck uh, by what Glenn mentioned. It, it, it is. It's like it, you see two yeah. signatures, and it's people looking at them. And they only can they can digitally verify about 10% of them, but the rest of them, they have to go through individually. It's a very labor-intensive process, and I think it would slow it down to have other people there mm -hmm. looking over their shoulder. Yeah, it's kind of curious, the vote by mail is maybe increasing participation, but slowing Slowing it down process. incredibly, yeah, I mean, and, and it, really to do all of the work that they have to do in two weeks is kind of striking. California has 30 days to mm -hmm. do their to, to their count. They're still counting. I think they've got two races, three races that are outstanding. But, um, you know, to, to do all of the labor they have to do to separate the ballots, inspect the ballots, tabulate ballots, do provisional ballots, do data entry on these provisional ballots. Mm -hmm. so the same day registration this year, 35,000 provisional ballots and it are still left to be counted in Salt Lake and Utah County. It's remarkable and it's going to take them true. a while. And that's enough to change this race too. It is. I mean, any yeah, with with a thousand vote lead that could flip and yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's that's what's going to decide this race is the mm -hmm. provisionals. Okay, I want to talk about while we're talking about lawsuits and mm -hmm. things that have been on the ballot. Let's talk about Proposition Two for a moment, Nicole, if we can. Uh, so it's a 52 percent right now. Uh, seems to be holding steady so far and the results that have come back on uh, medical marijuana. But uh, our own former mayor, Rocky Anderson, uh, has been out in the press, uh, particularly uh, this week, saying wants to file potentially a lawsuit against a few groups claiming that particularly the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had uh, too much influence. Right, so he sent a letter, Rocky Anderson, to some Republican lawmakers and LDS church lobbyists and the uh, Libertas Institute, groups that have been involved with um, putting together this compromise bill that, by the way, they're um, planning to vote on in just a few weeks, um, saying that the, the he cited the, the separation of church and state clause in the, in the Utah State Constitution, and, and he said that it's no secret that liquor, liquor bills, sex education bill, 
bills, um, other big issues like that don't pass in the Utah legislature without support of the LDS church. Mm -hmm. um, basically sent this letter to um, these groups and said, don't delete any of your communications because a lawsuit may be coming um, and trying to prove that, that the church had an outsized influence as, um, in Utah politics, as particularly on the issue of Proposition 2 and, and shaping medical mm -hmm. marijuana policy in Utah. Uh -huh. Glenn, let's talk about this outsized influence because this is such an interesting issue, right? It wasn't saying they shouldn't have any influence or a group, mm -hmm. but where is the line on this? Like too much influence is what they're saying happened. Is that, well, is that, I mean, it, it's politics. Big groups have a lot of influence. It doesn't matter whether uh, they're a religious organization or a company. I mean, Amazon could have too much influence on local politics. Look at uh, them trying to get their new sites. I mean, to say that a certain group has too much influence, uh, it's it's kind of erroneous when you think about it because anyone can have influence. Just because they're big doesn't necessarily make it illegal. I think the clause he's putting up, yeah. though, is you know the separation of church and state, that you're not supposed to put money or anything else behind it. But your voice, that's something different. Go ahead, Robert. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I think that the, the difference is that the church is a church and Amazon's mm -hmm. a corporation, yeah. you know? And so, you know, you have to start questioning because we've seen the church on multiple occasions in the past get involved in legislation and either kill legislation or promote legislation. Uh, they're, they're, they are the 800 pound gorilla when it comes to liquor laws and they're the 800 pound gorilla when it, when it comes to the marijuana law and, and to hate crimes and to the LGBT laws. Anything that deals with that, they have a hand in. And so, the, um, you know, is, is, it, is it proper, is it improper with this constitutional prohibition that Nicole mm -hmm. mentioned? Uh, it, it does raise questions. I, but, it, you know, personally, I feel like Yes, they're they're a, a major player in the community, and they're going to be consulted on issues where there's where there's issues mm -hmm. in the community. Do, are they able to call shots and dictate things and kill things? I think we've seen that in the past, and yes, they are they have. Um, so, making a legal argument that they shouldn't be doing that is going to be a challenge. I think. Yeah, for the mayor. and I, I think it's tough because you have seen challenges. I mean, for example, with uh, the California prop, um, uh, you know, they put money behind it, they put other things, and they still couldn't get them on that. So it, it's kind of tough. I think when you look at the Johnson Amendment and other things where they kind of want churches to stay out of it, um, it's it's tough because there hasn't been a real challenge to that where someone's lost. And because we haven't seen that, I think it's a tough thing for someone to prove just influence, especially when there wasn't money or anything else involved. I think one of the really interesting questions that comes out of Prop 2, and you guys probably have thoughts on this, is that uh, this is the first time I can recall the church being rolled by its members on an issue. They, mm -hmm. they had taken a, a position against Prop 2, but they saw this was going to pass anyway, and that's what led to this compromise. I don't know that I've ever seen when the church speaks, usually the people follow, and in this case, the people got out in front of the church, and they couldn't get them back into, into the, the tent. The polling did show that the church still has influence. When the church yeah. came out against Proposition 2, the poll numbers dropped significantly. And yes. I think what Glenn mentioned, um, well, first of all, the church has a right to weigh in on issues. They have every right to express opinions on policies, but Glenn mentioned the um, proving that. And I think that if this goes to court, that would be the hardest thing to prove. Mm -hmm. It did drop. I mean, we, were, we saw polling up around 70% mm -hmm. on this issue uh, a year ago, and, and it ended up passing, I think, 50, it's at 52, 53. 52%, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it, you can see the difference it made, but it, it was, it's the first time I can recall that, they're, uh -huh. that they, what, when they say they didn't like something, usually it just uh -huh. it goes, and so, goes so away. Let's keep this theme for just a moment sure. on Proposition 3 on Medicaid expansion, because religious entities in the state did weigh in on this one as well, right? So is it, is it the same argument, Glenn? Because we, we saw... Some religious institutions in the state say this is an important, compassionate thing that the yep. state should do. And it's kind of same argument, but not but no same argument, about that. different topic. And I think I think that some people are, you know, when it comes to Prop Two, I think they're upset because they wanted certain provisions that were in Prop Two that they don't believe are going to be in this compromise bill. And I think that's where this lawsuit is coming more out of frustration or anger with uh, with that. When it comes to Prop Three, same situation. A lot of different groups, including some religious organizations, did weigh in in favor of it. Uh, no one's talking about that. So it's it's kind of, you know, are you holding the same standard for everyone? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's yeah, an interesting question. I, but I want, to, I want to finally get to Proposition 4 on the Independent Redistricting Commission. This this is just so fascinating. What happened with that one? What, what did happen with <laughs> I, this? Because I was it's asking still you. up. <laughs> <laughs> you asked the questions. Okay, this time, how lucky I am this time. Yeah, so, so what's happening with that one? Why is it so close? 
Uh, you know, that's a that's a fascinating one because the polling data before the election was about 60 percent mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. were in favor of it. There was no coordinated opposition to it. And then you see the numbers come in and it's it's on a narrow margin. I think it passes because most of the uncounted ballots on that one are in Salt Lake County and it's, it favors it. But I, I can't explain why it was so close. And, and, and it's something that it seems like an easy case to an easy case to promote. Like if you're better boundaries, you have a do you like fair boundaries? Well, yes, I think we all like fair yeah. boundaries, right? And there was no opposition to it. So I'm not sure why voters ended up getting into these places. I, rural, rural Utah voted against it in a huge number. I, yeah. I would just want to, I, I suspected that this might happen. I noticed that the, the, the polling over the summer, the support was dropping a little bit, especially mm -hmm. among Republicans. Mm -hmm. I think that you're right that rural voters did uh, did not want this. They voted against it. And, and I talked to a lot of Republicans in, in reporting on this um, who weren't sure about it. There were a lot of undecided um, voters in, in those polls, too. But yeah. when I talked to Republicans, they're, they they don't have a problem with the redistricting process in the state right now. Um, they're, their party's in control. Mm -hmm. They have they have seats in Congress. They have a supermajority in the legislature. And they just they don't have a problem so with it. The party it. that's favored mm -hmm. is unlikely to uh, want to change it. That's right? always yeah. the case. But, but talk about your great point there, Minute, Nicole, on this, the rural Utah aspect. Uh, the people you're talking to, how do they see the current process as being a protection to the interests of rural Utah? Well, um, I talked to a, a voter in Cedar City specifically who's, you know, he's in the same congressional district as people in Salt Lake City, and, and that Congressman Stewart is a Republican. Mm -hmm. He had no problem with that, and he said he likes the fact that, that Congress, Utah's congressional representatives are representing urban and rural interests. Um, he, he thought that that mm -hmm. was a good safeguard, and I know that that's something that Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County voters do have a problem with. Okay. And, and, that, and that's the thing when it comes to props like that, you know, rural voters can either have their power taken away by gerrymandering, mm -hmm. or they can gain a lot yeah. of power. And I think in this state, rural voters gain a lot of power. Uh, you know, in other states, though, they tend to put in big cities into rural areas to make sure that their power is actually taken away. But as that voter said, I think that it is important for someone from Congress to have rural and urban issues because then that way they have to focus on all of it. When mm -hmm. it comes to representation, yes, the, the, our, our delegation does pay a lot of attention to the rural issues. Mm -hmm. When it comes to voting, they don't need to because we saw Juab and San Pete County are part of the 4th District. Their votes, we're not talking about their votes in deciding mm -hmm. the 4th District. Yeah. It's, it's it's Salt Lake County that's mm -hmm. going to decide it. Okay, I want to keep talking about rural Utah because uh, some changes in Congress are going to impact some things that happen in Utah, mm -hmm. particularly the rural parts of the state. So let's talk about this switch over that happened in the United States House of Representatives. Looks like the Democrats have picked up at least 38 seats uh, in the House. They're uh, right now at 231 seats to the Republicans at 199. As of today, we still mm -hmm. have a couple we're, lo we're, we're yeah. looking at and watching that are still they're still counting. Robert, how does this change impact us in Utah? Well, I mean, I think the biggest change is going to be uh, Congressman Rob Bishop. He's mm -hmm. been the chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee. He's had a good spot on the House Armed Services Committee, and he's going to lose the chairmanship of the Resources Committee. That uh, it, it's the committee that decides public land issues yeah. in the state, uh, and so that's going to be a big loss of, of power for him. Um, I think maybe second to that, you've got Chris Stewart, who's been a, has had a good good assignment on the Intelligence Committee. We don't know how that's going to shake out, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that Intelligence Committee is going to be important because one of the things, even if even if because of this split between the House and Senate and control of the House and Senate, we're not going to see a lot of legislation moving. Probably there's there are going to be a lot of investigations coming out of the House, and some of them are going to be in the House House Intelligence Committee. So House Stewart's role on that one shakes out uh -huh. is, is going to be important. Well, and I think it's one of those things. I mean, for Bishop, I mean, he's been in the minority before, and I think that for him. He's built a lot of good relationships. I think what we're going to see more of is that for Republicans to get more of the things they want, they're going to have to do more horse trading. They're going to have to make more compromises than they're used to. I mean, it's easier when you have both the House and the Senate to do more of what you want or bring up the issues you want. Now you kind of have to really do that deal making in mm -hmm. Washington in order to get what you want. And, you know, depending on how Democrats want to go, we might see less legislation and more, as you said, investigations. Well, I, I want to show a graphic as we get to that point, and then I want to talk about the oversight provisions. Uh, Mitt Romney has weighed in on this point that you were just making there about maybe needing to reach across the aisle a little bit. So I just want to show this one and, and get your comment. This is from Mitt Romney this week. It's always nice if you're in the majority party to say, hey, we don't need you guys. But the silver lining is being able to work together. The requirement of working together means that legislation that's passed is likely to endure as opposed to be overturned the next time 
the next party comes into power. Is Mitt Romney, is, Nicole, is this, is this guy kind of making the best of the situation, or think, is this really well, what's going to happen? He's been touting his um, bipartisanship and willing to reach across the aisle um, throughout his campaign. And I think what we'll see put to the test is Republicans have been in the majority in Congress for a long time, a few years now, and and we'll see how how willing they are to be able to reach across the aisle to to pass stuff, um, mm -hmm. work with Democrats, and um, how maybe rusty they are at that. Okay, <laughs> I guess we'll see. Uh, uh, let's let's get to that part about uh, our public lands for just a moment. We're all excited to watch the KUED piece on Bears Ears, yeah. but how will this change, Glenn, uh, impact the efforts for uh, Bears Ears National Monument here in the state? I think it's definitely gonna make a big change, not only uh, because of what's happening in Congress, but also what's happening in San Juan County with the commission there. Uh, there's now two uh, Navajos. So let's mention for the sake of throwing us, yep. um, we have two, Kenneth Mary Boy, Willie Gray Eyes, both both Navajos now on that county commission. Yeah. And That's kind of a big deal. They've been huge into conservation, and Bears Ears has obviously been a big topic. So, you know, when you talk to leadership in San Juan County, you're also talking with them. And what I think we're going to see is we're going to see more of an effort with the Democrats there on conservation. But, you know, there's a lot of Democrats in the West where they also have to deal with public lands. So now that Democrats have control, this could be the great compromise um, that ends up being made, where if you want, especially with all the forest fires and other things we've seen, and we know that we need more land management in the West, where you could come up with this grand bargain. Uh, I know that Bishop tried it with uh, Jason Chaffetz uh, many years ago when I think they were still in the minority, but um, this would be the time to work it out now that you have this split house and that way everybody can get something that they want, but it's going to be interesting to see because then again, we could also see everyone just go back to their corners. We could see the tribalism and we could see this just be another issue and basically waiting for another president to maybe put it back into place. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting because this is very much in the hands of the courts right now. The, the, the tribes have sued over, over the dismantling of the Bears Ears Monument. Uh, the argument we've heard from Gary Herbert, from Orrin Hatch, from all of the local leaders is let's, let's listen to the locals. Well, it's kind of hard to argue that now when you've got two council members, and, and this issue was front and center in that yes. election. And you've got two council members now who both support the monument. San Juan County has been a party to the litigation. Are they going to have to back away from that? Yeah. I think that remains to be seen. I think as far as legislative solutions, I'm not confident that there's going to be many legislative solutions to anything over the next two years because well, even though Mitt Romney says it's a good idea to come to agreement, I don't think there's going to be much agreement on these things. So I think it's going to work its way through the courts, but it is a historic shift in, in San Juan County to have two members of the Navajo Nation on the council for the first time and, mm -hmm. and representing a majority in the county. Mm -hmm. Rob Bishop and Republicans on that Natural Resources Committee had the chance to push through the bill to codify Trump's um, dismantling of the mm -hmm. Bears Ears mm -hmm. National Monument. It hasn't gone through yet, and I, I think that that is definitely in peril when when Democrats take over the House. Okay, so uh, when they do take over the House, let's talk. I want to spend just a moment on this. They're going to have a new power that they didn't have when they were in the minority party, and that is this oversight power, mm -hmm. right? Glenn, uh, what are we seeing with this? Is it, uh, is, is, I mean, because Robert was talking yeah. about this, this may be a whole lot of just fighting now, with, without a ton of stuff happening. Yeah, so. and, and I think what we're going to see is, you know, you, you thought Benghazi was an investigation. <laughs> Just wait till you see every everyone have their own investigation from every from every different, you know, committee. Um, and so I think we're going to see a lot of that. We're going to see a lot of uh, what you call dog and pony shows, too. Uh, we're going to see a lot of people just trying to make their case that they're out there standing up for it. But this is also an opportunity where Democrats, they do have this newfound power, but they also have to prove something in the next two years that they're not just going there to fight that they actually said that they were going there to fix something. And let's not forget that the last time that we had a balanced budget and a surplus in this country was when we had a Republican House and Senate and a Democratic president. So they have an opportunity to fix some stuff, but I think with the way President Trump is going, uh, he, how he's kind of going a little bit stronger against the Democrats, I think what we're going to see over the next two years is a lot of fighting and some uh, basically setting up for 2020. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Robert. Sorry. There's already been talk. I mean, I think the Democrats 
have a real opportunity to overplay their hand and it mm -hmm. could blow up in their face. I think the investigations are something that have kind of been lacking over the last couple of years, but, uh, and that sounds weird to say because we always talk about the Russia investigation, but that's sort of a separate thing. Uh, you know, but they have a chance to overplay their hand and there's already talk about impeachment and I think that's putting the cart way before the horse. But the fact that there is are the investigations, they have to be careful not to step on the Mueller investigation, mm -hmm. I think. But there are issues that have been sort of swept aside and, and, and ignored and I think that's not going to happen anymore. Um, we've seen some at the Interior Department, we've seen some at the EPA that just sort of get overlooked. So this this is going to be a, a power they can have to hold, the, you know, to try to hold the administration accountable, probably, as Glenn mentioned, kind of score some political mm -hmm. points along the way, right? Um, but the, the big investigation, the Mueller investigation, is going to hopefully move along a separate track. Okay. Uh, can we switch gears, talk about our local races? Yeah. I want to talk about the new uh, majority leadership in our our Utah State uh, Senate and House. I want to tell you where they're from. Let's talk about how this, this is going to change. Uh, speaker Brad Wilson, the new Speaker of the House, is from Kaysville. Majority Leader Francis Gibson from Mapleton. Uh, majority Whip Mike Schultz is from Hooper. And Assistant Whip Val Peterson from Orem. We got a little bit of a spread right there. I think it's Hooper. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, you, you, you know. Nicole, what I think is it. most interesting is there's no representation from Salt Lake County in Republican leadership. Mm -hmm. um, that went from Greg Hughes and Senate President Wayne Niederhauser, both representing South Salt Lake County. You see this enormous power shift now to Davis County mm -hmm. and Utah County. Um, I'm not sure what happened there, but... Just we, we've kind of had that. We've had that before. I think back in 2004, there were, there weren't any Salt Lake County members. But it is it is sort of telling that that's where the mm -hmm. that's where the power uh, con centers are now. Um, and these, you know, Wilson and Adams are two very capable legislators. When there's been any big issues coming well, down the pike, so Adams well, you're mentioning, Stuart Adams, the new Stuart president Adams, of the Senate, the Senate president. Yeah, the, when when they are the ones who have handled big issues over the past, mm -hmm. and I think it put them on that trajectory to All be right. in leadership. Well, watch their new leadership come yeah. in and. Well, with close attention. Thank you for your comments and insights today. Thank you. That's it for this edition of the Hinkley Report. Coming up next on KUED is a documentary you won't want to miss, Battle Over Bears Ears. Explore what is fueling the fight over how Bears Ears National Monument is protected and managed. We hope you'll watch. Thank you and good night.